Good evening. I'm Dina Mansour, Executive Director of the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center. Welcome to our Civil Discourse Dialogues tonight, featuring Matt Pottinger in a conversation moderated by Tiff Roberts. I want to thank our audience for joining us this evening and to particularly thank the Mansfield Center staff that have worked so hard to put this dialogue together, including our student employee, Mariah Thomas and Randy Edwards. And also to the audience in particular, thanks for already submitting a number of great questions. We have integrated those into the discussion, but we encourage you to continue to add those questions in the Q&A box. At the University of Montana, we always begin our discussions with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Today, we honor the path that they have always shown for us in caring for this place for generations to come. The Mansfield Center was endowed by an act of Congress in 1983 in order to carry forward Mike Mansfield's legacy of statesmanship, ethics, and civility in public affairs. We foster globally minded leaders of integrity with a focus on democratic institutions and global mutual understanding, especially with Asia. Mansfield had a passion for Asia that began when he visited China as a young Marine in 1922. He next returned to China for a special mission for President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1944, and then helped to lay the groundwork for President Nixon's overture to China. In a 1968 speech here at the University of Montana, Mansfield argued that the almost cyclical nature of the US-China relationship, in which alternating periods of Western infatuation and fear of China dominated US policy, had to be overcome in order to end the mutual distrust and suspicion between the two sides. This evening's conversation will explore this great power competition and China's challenge in the form of disinformation and influence operations. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening, Dexter Tiff Roberts. Tiff is an award-winning writer and speaker who previously spent more than two decades as China Bureau Chief and Asian News Editor of Bloomberg Businessweek, reporting from all of China's provinces and regions, as well as Taiwan, Mongolia, and North Korea. He now serves as an adjunct professor in political science and a Mansfield Center at the University of Montana, and as a non-resident senior fellow in the Atlantic Council's Asia Security Initiative. He has recently launched a China newsletter called Trade War, and his book, The Myth of Chinese Capitalism, The Worker, The Factory, and the Future of the World, was published in March 2020. Tiff, thanks so much for inviting Matt to join us this evening and for moderating this evening's discussion. Thank you, Dina, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I am very pleased tonight to introduce our speaker. Matt Pottinger is a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. Until recently, he served four years in the White House National Security Council in senior roles and including uh, Deputy National Security Advisor. Before his White House service in the late 90s and the early 2000s, Matt was a journalist for Reuters and also the Wall Street Journal in China, which is when we first met. After that, Matt fought in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the US Marines, in three combat deployments between 2007 and 2010. Matt, as I think all of you know, has played a key role in the ongoing rethinking of the U.S. relationship with China. As former National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster put it, quote, Matt Pottinger conceptualized and drove the most important shift in U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. He was referring to Matt's role in reorienting the United States towards great power competition with China. Matt is a rare creature here in the US who as a strategic thinker and a foreign policy expert on China, not only is fluent in Mandarin Chinese, uh, tonight's uh, address will be in English for all of us, but he has done a number of recent addresses in Mandarin as well, but also, he lived and worked for a number of years within China. 
Tonight we will start with Matt's address, which I believe is going to take about 20 minutes. Uh, uh, we will have questions after that. I, I will start as the moderator, use my moderator's prerogative, and then we will have plenty of time for questions from the audience. We've already received quite a few good ones. Please keep sending them in through the chat function. Uh, tonight's event will last about one hour, so that means that we are planning to finish right around 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, if slightly after that. Okay, with that, I would like to hand this over to our speaker. Please go ahead, Matt. Hey, Tiff, thanks so much. Dina, thank you for the introduction and for hosting me tonight. Tiff, it's, it's great to be together with you. We've been friends uh, for many decades. Um, and uh, it, like Mike Mansfield before us, as Dina was just referring to, uh, um, you, you and I were formed in part by our experiences living in China um, uh, in, in the uh, 90s uh, onwards. And of course, um, you went on to author one of the best and most original books I've read in recent years about China. I went on to uh, go fight battles in Iraq and Afghanistan and in the West Wing <laughs> of the White House. But, um, but I, I want to congratulate uh, you both and congratulate Dina and all of your colleagues on uh, 38 years of the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center and, and on the center's terrific mission to uh, enhance understanding between the US and Asia. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Mike Mansfield uh, is the way that he decided to be commemorated on his gravestone. Uh, and his tombstone could have featured any number of, uh, of distinctions and honors. He'd been a professor of history at the University of Montana. He'd been a United States Senator. He'd been the longest serving Senate majority leader in US history. Uh, and he'd also been the longest serving U.S. ambassador to Japan, uh, serving both uh, Jimmy Carter and, and Ronald Reagan. Uh, so he was a, a towering figure of the 20th century. And yet when he died in 2001 at, at 98 years of age, uh, his grave marker at Arlington National Cemetery was etched to say, Michael Joseph Mansfield, Private, United States Marine Corps. And that's it. So uh, he, uh, he basically chose to highlight the lowest rank that he'd ever held in public life. In fact, it's the, lo it's the lowest rank uh, that, that the military even offers. And he's now simply recognized as a uh, private Mansfield. And so uh, United States Marines like myself uh, take pride in that story. I I've known that story since I first went into the Marine Corps. Uh, and not just for the predictable petty reason that uh, Mansfield chose to highlight his Marine Corps service and not his earlier service in, uh, in the Army and the Navy, uh, although for the record, uh, that's true. Um, but what really moves us about that story is uh, the gravestone's message of humility. And humility is really the first step in civility. And Private Mansfield knew better than anyone that civility is actually an act of citizenship. Uh, it's, it, the word civility is derived from uh, Latin and old French terms for good citizenship. So please bear that in mind, uh, this idea of private Mansfields, that civility is actually a civic duty in free societies like ours. And uh, keep that in mind as I talk just for a few minutes uh, at the outset about some of the threats to our democracy uh, emanating from overseas, but also here closer, uh, closer to home. So uh, the, it's also useful to bear in mind that democracy is not inevitable. Uh, even our independence is not inevitable. A and uh, and uh, the history, interestingly enough, of Poland underscores what could have been the fate of the United States if not for a few lucky breaks uh, early in our history. Uh, so just a few years after the US Constitution had come into effect in 1789, uh, there was a group of visionary Polish citizens who drew up a revolutionary document for their country. And uh, this constitution that the Poles framed uh, was, was similar in a lot of ways to ours. It was designed to limit the powers of government, uh, to assert the rights of the people, and they hoped that it would chart, chart a path towards uh, really, you know, a lasting democracy. And... Um, you probably didn't read a lot about that in history classes, and that's because this experiment, this Polish experiment with constitutional government was strangled in its infancy. And the problem was foreign interference. It was foreign interference by foreign governments. So you had a faction of the Polish nobility 
uh, that felt threatened by the power that they might lose under this new constitution. And so they sought help from the Russians uh, in reestablishing the old order. Catherine the Great seized the opportunity uh, to invade and then partition Poland. She took the East and, and Prussia took the, the West. And uh, pro-democracy leaders attempted a rebellion. They wanted to, to try to reestablish this constitution, uh, but it was crushed. Uh, and um, the, the Russians, the, Aus the Austrians, uh, and the Prussians carried out a final partition of Poland, Lithuania in 1795. And so you had this young commonwealth and nascent democracy that was erased from the map altogether. Uh, so believe it or not, this actually leads to China in a minute, but, but the United States was actually lucky to have this advantage that Poland lacked. And that was of course, favorable geography. Poland's 18th century neighbors uh, were powerful European monarchies uh, and America's neighbors by contrast were the two best friends that a fledgling democracy could ever have, the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, but now that we're in the cyber age, even mighty oceans are insufficient barriers to prevent foreign interference in our democracy. And autocratic governments uh, concoct disinformation. They inject it into the public discourse of countries, including our own via social media platforms. And then they amplify it through self-improving algorithms. Uh, and they can do this all from the other side of the earth. So my four years on the National Security Council staff convinced me that democracies are actually undergoing the first stage of a real life stress test of their ability to withstand malign influence by high tech autocracies. Uh, online disinformation is increasingly important and potent as a tool in the arsenal of foreign governments uh, that, that do not mean us well. And I know that that might seem odd because autocracies are so vastly outnumbered by democracies, uh, but they compensate by marshalling the full resources of their states, by learning from one another how to wield disinformation, and, and also by coordinating with one another. And there, one example is just in yesterday's Wall Street Journal, there was a story about how Russia, Iran, and China are waging a coordinated and global disinformation campaign claiming that US COVID vaccines are unsafe and ineffective. So I'd like to dwell uh, for a few minutes on China in particular, because there's really no regime that has more riding on its uh, ability to influence the perceptions and the policies and the priorities of foreign populations, including the US population, than the Chinese Communist Party. So in truth, we, we probably should have expected this because the, the Chinese Communist Party by its own admission owes its rise to power in part on its ability to infiltrate and manipulate language, thinking and actions of its adversaries. And uh, that's why information warfare and what the Chinese Communist Party calls cognitive and psychological warfare uh, are really at the heart of, of its in international strategy. Um, Chinese officials have been taking to, uh, to Twitter. They've been flooding YouTube uh, as well with, uh, uh, and other social media platforms with commentary, um, slickly produced videos and podcasts, and also ad hominem attacks on people that they perceive to be their foes. And uh, th they do this even as those same uh, platforms are universally banned inside of China itself. Uh, China has invested billions of dollars into propaganda outlets in virtually every language and country, even as they've banned foreign media uh, and even increasingly a, a great number of foreign journalists uh, from operating inside of China. Uh, they've also redoubled their efforts to conduct covert influence activities around the globe, even as they restrict traditional overt diplomatic activity by foreign diplomats and civic groups inside China's borders. So the Chinese Communist Party calls these activities as a whole, this umbrella of activities, united front work, united front work. And China's united front work system is actually a gigantic government function uh, with no analog in Western democracies. Uh, Chinese leaders call it a magic weapon, and all of the party's 90 million members uh, are required to support its activities. And while the system has a great many branches, the United Front Work Department by itself has four times as many cadres as the United States State Department has uh, foreign service officers. Uh, but, but this isn't diplomacy, right? This is, United Front Work is really about gathering intelligence 
about and then working to influence private citizens overseas, as well as public officials. Uh, and they do this by offering inducements to people that the party finds useful to their goals, uh, such as, for example, scientists who have access to cutting edge technology, uh, but they also act to isolate people that they find troublesome uh, through relentless online attacks uh, uh, as one, as one mean, means of doing that. So United Front workers are, are a bit of a platypus. You know, they're, they're a cross between uh, an intelligence officer, a propagandist, and a psychologist. And it's, it's sort of a funny image to think about, but, but it really shouldn't be underestimated because the raw material for psychologists is data about their patients. And the Chinese government is compiling digital dossiers on millions and millions of foreign citizens around the world. And the exposure last year of a Chinese database, the accidental uh, leakage of, of a Chinese database of uh, at least 2.4 million people around the world speaks to the, speaks to the ambition of China's effort. And that was just one database by one Chinese company. But those databases uh, are, and dossiers in them included people in virtually every country on earth, no matter how small, they included members of royal families and members of parliament, judges, down to clerks, tech mavens, budding entrepreneurs, uh, four-star admirals, crew members of warships in the US Navy, professors and think tankers uh, and national as well as local officials in foreign countries. And they also include children who are not uh, off limits under Beijing's rules of political warfare. So no one is too prominent, no one is too obscure, uh, to be of interest. And assembling dossiers has always been a feature of Leninist regimes. But what's new is how easy we've made it for autocratic regimes to accumulate so much intimate data about ourselves. The smartphones that we use all day to chat, to search, to tweet, buy, view, bank, navigate, and, and network, as well as worship and confide, make our thoughts and our actions uh, quite plain uh, to uh, cyber spooks uh, and, and really leave our lives open like open books. What's also new is the potential through social media platforms for these autocratic governments to reach and influence broad swaths of our society. And Chinese officials, uh, just like Russian security services, pay very close attention to the most inflammatory and the most divisive issues that are trending online uh, here and around the world. And they seek to, to deepen those divisions as well as manipulate them to their advantage and even to sow doubt about the viability of democracy itself. That's a recurring meme in, in Chinese uh, disinformation campaigns and propaganda campaigns. It's, it's that, that democracy uh, doesn't work, it's not sustainable uh, and, and is ultimately doomed. So in a way, uh, we're all complicit in, in a way in making ourselves in our open society easier targets for this kind of foreign disinformation. And that's because of the tenor of our social media discourse here in the United States. It's, it's, it's incredibly negative to begin with, even before you introduce uh, disinformation from abroad. And social media algorithms uh, push stories and posts that reaffirm our biases uh, and that also fuel regular and highly unproductive peaks of outrage. I mean, you think about how much time people spend uh, be, uh, feeling outraged by what they're reading on their various social, social uh, media posts. So anger, pride, intolerance are all featured in ample supply on your average social media feed. Um, I read just the other day a, a provocative and very well-written article called The Specter of Totalitarianism, uh, which appeared this month in a new or, or a resurrected UK publication called The Critic. And the author, Edward Skidelsky, uh, argues that intolerance opens the door to a totalitarian mindset uh, that he argues is already creeping into our culture. Uh, and he writes that, quote, tolerance in the classical liberal sense involves the simultaneous affirmation of two propositions, that one, an idea or a practice is wrong, and two, that it still has a right to exist. Uh, and so when we look at things like cancel culture, which abounds online, and, and I dare say on many college campuses as well, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the focus of cancel culture is on the first part, that an idea is wrong, uh, but it completely ignores the second part of the idea of, of tolerance in a liberal democratic sense, 
uh, where we affirm that an idea, even one that we think is wrong, still has, an, has a right to exist and to be discussed. Uh, so I, uh, I wanted to close with a modest proposal <laughs> for, for uh, reintroducing a, a greater measure of tolerance in our public debate. And it starts with a very Mike Mansfield style allegiance to this notion of civility. So the idea is to adopt a simple code in how we conduct ourselves when we're arguing online or in the real world. And the code has three principles, just three simple principles. One, refrain from making ad hominem attacks on your opponent. That is, attack your opponent's argument, but don't attack the person making the argument. Second, refrain from ascribing evil motives to your opponent. In fact, you should really try to give your opponent the benefit of the doubt that their motive for holding a certain belief is well intended, even if you disagree with it. And third and finally, use your real name. Or if you use a handle online, at least make sure that your real name is discoverable relatively easily. So uh, people tend to make, you know, slightly, take slightly greater care in the comments that they make when they know that they own them. Uh, and in the days before social media, it was very rare for newspaper editors to publish anonymous letters. And that's because readers uh, demand a degree of accountability from, from uh, those uh, people that, that they're reading. Um, so uh, the second part of, and final part of my proposal, uh, if you'll bear with me, is actually for the social media platforms themselves to permit people who adhere voluntarily to switch their accounts over to a civility mode, um, uh, you know, that, that, that they would permit people to sort of operate in a civility mode. And in civility mode, only posts that adhere to those three principles I mentioned, no ad hominem attacks, no ascribing evil motives to contributors, and no complete anonymity. Uh, and, and so posts in civility mode uh, that adhere to those three principles would appear in, in people's feeds. If a post doesn't meet any of those three principles, it just gets regulated to the regular feed, which, which you might call sewer mode. So you've got civility mode and sewer mode. So I'm still working out the details and I'll, I'll send a proposal to Jack Dorsey at Twitter and Mark Zuckerberg at uh, Facebook soon. Um, uh, but again, the idea is voluntary. Uh, no one gets canceled from a platform altogether for failing to be civil. It's just that their uncivil discourse isn't gonna be seen by those people who want uh, to, to read civil discourse only. And it also doesn't involve that nettlesome uh, matter of trying to be the arbiter of what's true and what's untrue uh, or, ca or canceling what's deemed uh, uh, by a, a platform or, or a, a person to be untrue. Uh, that's really sticky business. Uh, th there are objective truths and there are subjective truths, but I think the truths that we all hold most dearly are usually a bit of both. Uh, our, our faith, uh, and our ideals certainly fall into that category of, of, of a mix of subjectivity and objectivity. Um, so uh, a good measure of civility, I think, uh, would make it harder as well for China, Russia, Iran, and other regimes that are hostile to liberal democracy to inflict so much harm on us uh, through their information warfare. And uh, as Mike Mansfield would have said, uh, civility is also a good act uh, of citizenship. And so uh, thanks very much. And, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Matt, for those, that very thought provoking, interesting address and, and alarming as well, I should say, in, in many ways. Um, as you explained so well, we're facing uh, a, a formidable challenge in both uh, uh, disinformation from abroad, from countries like China and, and also here at home. Uh, you mentioned uh, the coordinated campaign by China, the Soviet Russia, and others to uh, to denigrate our vaccines. Um, that can't uh, I can't help but thinking about uh, the COVID deniers we have here in our own country um, and the very prominent role they've had at one of our uh, top cable news networks, which I would argue has also played a tremendously important role in disinformation uh, here. Uh, affecting all of us here in the United States. So my question I, for you is, what practical steps can be taken by the US government, um, but also clearly by uh, our big social media companies, which are integral to any sort of solution to the, to the, the scourge of disinformation, um, and, and, also, and also our media as well, to try to deal with uh, this this tremendous onslaught of disinformation, which is so damaging 
uh, to yeah. our social cohesion and our country as a whole. Yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, it, there, there are several things that have to be done and, and uh, the media has to reassert itself in the role of um, being a, a dispassionate, uh, relatively objective. I mean, everyone has biases, newspapers and newspaper reporters have them, but making an effort to be fair as well as skeptical of all points of view that are being presented. That's the role, that, that, that should be the role of the media, right? Um, it, it's presenting uh, not uh, just becoming a channel for uh, bile that 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 uh, dominates um, either the cable news channels or or um, social media feeds, uh, but taking a step back from that and uh, making an attempt to to uh, to weigh and assess uh, different points of view, to actually present different points of view, even if the reporter doesn't subscribe to one of those points of view. That's one part of it. Second, I, I mean the the idea of um, um, I, I've thought a, a bit about this idea of, you know, trying to determine what's disinformation and what's not. And, 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 and like I mentioned in my remarks, I think this is really, really sticky, uh, sticky business uh, because so much is subjective uh, in, in what, what we hold to be dear and true. And that's why I think the idea of approaching it first through civility, I mean, um, in sort of the golden age of newspaper journalism before the internet really took off, uh, but, but after uh, earlier periods of, of, of more sloppy tabloid journalism, you had this golden period that, uh, Tiff, you and I were lucky enough to sort of surf the final, the final decade of um, uh, when, when the financial model worked well enough that you could actually fund really high quality journalism and high standards. Um, you wouldn't, you would never have seen the kind of discourse in newspapers that you see just routinely on cable news and, um, and, and on social media. You, you would see a much higher quality of discourse, um, including on the editorial page where you've got different points of view. And I, I've always recommended that people uh, subscribe to at least one publication that uh, holds um, kind of uh, an incongruent view, even the opposite political view of, of where you feel comfortable. Um, my, my, I practice that here at home. Um, just to challenge, uh, uh, especially with high quality publications, uh, to, to challenge your thinking about some of those ideas and, and, and to foster a stronger sense of, of uh, civility and a sense of community, you know, just the sense that, that uh, that uh, even people who have different political views are still are still fundamentally Americans, um, but it's 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 sticky business. I, I don't think that doing nothing is going to uh, uh, get us there or or save us. I, I feel like we're flying in in clouds right now, and we're headed towards a mountain. And level steady flight is going to crash us into a mountain. So there there are steps that have to be taken, but they've got to be taken with with a liberal with a small L. Uh, point of view, a liberal democratic, classical liberal point of view uh, that that uh, entertains um, and is tolerant of uh, ideas that we don't like. Mm -hmm. So shifting direction a little bit here to the larger foreign policy relationship between the U.S. and China, the Trump administration, which you served in, has uh, been given credit, and I think rightly so, for uh, carrying out an overdue rethinking of our relationship with China, focusing more on the places uh, where we do have real challenges, whether it be uh, practices of cyber espionage or the mercantilist trade policies carried out so uh, brazenly by China. At the same time, many people have said that under Trump, some of our closest ally relations with our closest allies, including in Asia and in Europe, have been damaged. And that has made it more difficult for us to meet the challenge of a rising China. Um, first of all, I'm interested in what your response is to that criticism. I'm wondering what you think about the Biden administration's now much professed plan to rebuild relations with allies, even as they continue to take a tough stance towards China. Are there any pitfalls in trying to simultaneously rebuild all those relationships while uh, continuing to confront China. And uh, I'm also interested in what you think about 
what appears to be with the new administration, an emphasis on turning to the so-called Quad, which as you well know, the, the, the strategic grouping, which includes the US, Japan, Australia, and India. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the media uh, focused on President Trump's, um, uh, you know, tough rhetoric, but towards European uh, uh, allies in particular, you know, his, his view that we're being taken advantage of and that, that uh, uh, Europeans need to share a much larger shoulder uh, or, 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 or share of the burden of uh, Europe's defense, for example. The United States accounts for 70% of the uh, defense spending for Europe's defense, uh, even though Europe's economy is, uh, uh, you know, comparable. Um, and, uh, and, but in fact, I, I would challenge the assertion that, that the relationships in Asia were damaged. That, that's not what uh, Asian leaders themselves uh, expressed to us. Um, the, the government of Japan expressed that they thought that um, th the approach that we took, the fact that we were willing to impose costs on China and, and to, uh, uh, to drive a hard line uh, was, uh, to their minds, something that, that helped enhance the relationship and, and the alliance. Uh, we heard great things from Vietnam, from Taiwan, uh, certainly from India, where we had a real breakthrough during the, the Trump administration uh, in uh, both bilateral ties, but also, as you referred to, in quadrilateral ties. Remember, the quad this idea that was really put forth first by the Japanese Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe, more than a decade ago, that you would have a natural grouping in the Indo-Pacific region between the great democracies, uh, uh, India to the west, America to the east, uh, Australia to the south, and Japan to the north, almost a diamond. He used to describe it as a diamond. Um, that concept was always very very appealing, but never got off the ground because either India got cold feet or the Australians would get cold feet. Uh, under the last administration, we were able to push um, uh, that, that concept uh, to take flight. And uh, we ended up having for the first time in its history, uh, two cabinet level meetings among the Quad members and a whole host of, uh, of uh, sub cabinet level meetings, including uh, at my level, deputy national security advisors. We had regular um, uh, 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 video teleconferences, classified video teleconferences where we talked about our common agenda for uh, rebuilding our economies post COVID, uh, diversifying our supply chains, pushing back against disinformation uh, by uh, autocratic governments, including China. And so what you're gonna see now is uh, as that's taken flight, the next logical step that I'm, I'm very encouraged to see that the Biden administration is, is going to take, uh, according to news reports, uh, will be a summit level meeting among those quad leaders. That's a really important uh, breakthrough. It provides a natural uh, sort of counterweight to um, the Chinese strategy, which is to build rather than, you know, have, have a collection of co-equal sovereign countries, the Chinese strategy is to build a hierarchical, uh, uh, almost imperial in some ways, um, uh, Sinocentric uh, uh, sphere of influence in Asia. And so, the, so the, the Quad is one grouping that can help counterbalance and prevent that kind of an outcome that would erode uh, sovereignty and independence and, and ultimately the prosperity and security of uh, countries along China's periphery. Uh, when we look at Asia today, uh, you know, it seems as if we see conflict everywhere from uh, some of the issues we've seen in the South China Sea to the Indian Chinese uh, uh, many skirmishes where people have died uh, in the Himalaya to uh, the Senkaku Islands near Japan um, and of course uh, Taiwan. I'm interested uh, when you look at the region, uh, given all your experience, what what are you really the most concerned about? And, and what do you think, therefore, uh, the US government should really, I'm sure she should be focusing on everything, but what do we really need to focus in on now as potentially the real uh, flashpoint, uh, which could spark uh, a real confrontation between the US and China? Yeah, I, I think um, one flashpoint is China itself, meaning uh, just internally. Um, uh, if you look at the steps that China has taken, um, in, especially in the past couple of years, 
um, uh, st starting at least since 2017, the, uh, the, the archipelago of concentration camps, forced labor camps uh, in Xinjiang, uh, where they're intern interning um, uh, ethnic and religious minority groups. Um, I, I think you, you, you've seen that the Biden administration reaffirmed uh, the, the Trump administration's um, determination that a genocide is taking place in Xinjiang. Uh, just overnight, I saw that there was a, um, a group of um, international NGOs uh, and legal scholars that uh, weighed all of the available evidence about what's happening in Xinjiang uh, and found that every single provision of the UN Charter on Genocide um, has been violated uh, uh, in other words, satisfies uh, a definition that uh, genocide is taking place in China. We've seen the Canadian Parliament reaffirm this, the Dutch Parliament. So there, there's a growing recognition that, that a genocide is taking place inside China's borders. Also last year, uh, China uh, determined that it did not want to live up to its uh, international treaty with, with Great Britain, which it had registered at the United Nations to honor uh, a high degree of autonomy for Hong Kong for 50 years, all the way through uh, 2047. Uh, they, they, they called that short uh, uh, by, by you know, uh, half roughly, uh, and uh, have moved to undermine the rule of law, uh, democracy, they've been jailing opposition politicians, just dem democracy politicians uh, under a, uh, a vague subversion uh, law. Uh, uh, you have the situation that you mentioned where, where uh, China's leader seems to um, want to make his legacy annexing Taiwan by force if necessary. And it's hard to imagine any other way that they would be able to annex Taiwan given uh, what a um, uh, distressing proposition it is for Taiwan people to be, uh, to, to imagine being ruled by Beijing at a moment when there's a genocide and the destruction of Hong Kong. Uh, taking place. So these are the, these are not the actions of a confident government. These are the actions of a highly paranoid government that uh, fears above all and fears well above uh, its its fear of the United States. Uh, really, its own people. It fears its own people first. If you look at the amount of money that China spends on its internal surveillance and its internal security, uh, it, it now significantly outweighs uh, the amount of money that they spend on their military. And by the way, the military sometimes gets called in to participate in, uh, in uh, uh, repression of the local population, the, the, the domestic civilian population, as we saw back in 1989 uh, with the massacre of students around Tiananmen Square. So I actually think that the, 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 the inherent weakness of China's system is itself a, a potential flashpoint. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned uh, Xi Jinping, who of course plays uh, uh, an outsized role in, in so much of, of what uh, concerns us about China today, whether it's the economy, politics, uh, military, and so on. Um, recently, uh, we saw the publication of an anonymous, uh, anonymously, anonymously authored uh, piece on on uh, U.S. relations with China uh, called the Longer Telegram, which of course you are familiar with. Uh, amongst its various uh, proposals, one was that we should think about uh, turning our uh, efforts towards focusing on the eventual stepping down or removal of General Secretary Xi Jinping. Yeah, and sort of the implicit uh, suggestion was, I think it was re relatively implicit, was that there are potentially reformers waiting in the wings within the Chinese Communist Party who would be uh, potentially far more uh, amenable to having a better relationship uh, on, on terms that wouldn't, that both sides could agree on. Um, I'm wondering what you think of that, that particular proposition, uh, mm -hmm. focusing on Xi Jinping as the real target of, of the problems that we face in China? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. I, 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 um, I, I did read that, uh, the, that anonymous um, longer telegram. I, I thought it was a useful document. You know, I, it had good sections on uh, how Beijing sees the world, 
uh, and, and so the aggressive, really relentless threat that it poses to democracy globally. That, that was a very clear um, assumption made by wh whoever the author was of that document. I don't know who wrote it. Uh, it explores Beijing's vulnerabilities as well, which I think is always always useful. U.S. and European policymakers too often forget to bear in mind all the inherent weaknesses of, of uh, Beijing's model. Uh, but I, I, I think the analyst uh, or the, the author or authors um, tied, tied themselves in knots with some of the policy recommendations uh, that were made. Um, the most problematic objective uh, that, that they laid out, I think, was uh, the idea that, that the U.S. Um, must make its foremost objective, um, uh, uh, however they phrase it, you know, convincing the Chinese Communist Party to support a U.S.-led uh, liberal international order and, and not build an autocratic uh, alternative to that. But that, that, that is a very unrealistic uh, goal. That's really what we've been trying, we're trying to do with 30 years of failed policy uh, uh, before uh, 2017. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's a lit, you know, it, it's like telling, you know, the Communist Party to stop being a Leninist single party regime. It, it, in, in a way, it's the way that Beijing reads that proposition is actually some form of regime change. Uh, and so I, I just find that unrealistic. It's like, um, it's like saying our foremost goal is to, is to train a great white shark uh, to become a bottlenose dolphin. You know, it's, it's like it, it defies the laws of nature. You can't do that. Uh, and so we should, we should have more um, uh, uh, realistic goals in mind. Um, the idea that, that we should, uh, that the author of that put forward that you should criticize mainly Xi Jinping, but not the party as a whole. I, 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 I think I know what, what, they're, uh, what they're after. I don't think that um, it's, it's realistic. Uh, that we would be able to cleave away um, Xi Jinping from, from, from the rest of the party. The, you know, he, he is, to my mind, and even I think, I think the author of that report even said it himself, said that Xi Jinping is actually representing the, the grand strategy and aspirations that the Chinese Communist Party has held for a long time. It's simply that he's accelerated them and, and taken some rather draconian steps uh, to implement a totalitarian uh, surveillance system using high technology and so forth um, in, in ways that, that do mark a departure from Deng Xiaoping's era. But, um, but uh, you know, my view is that, that uh, there should be costs associated uh, with being a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, uh, if you're a member of that party, it, it means that you are partly responsible for the shame uh, of, of the Chinese nation, which is this genocide that's taking place, I, I don't think that that uh, that those actions are representative of the Chinese people. They're not representative of the Chinese nation, but they are representative of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and so I, I do think that uh, there should be. Um, uh, I don't think we should be timid about uh, criticizing the party or its ideology or its uh, horrific atrocities that it's uh, that it's uh, committing. Mm. Um, multinationals changing gears a bit again. Multinationals, including some of our very biggest American companies, are facing pressures in China today. Um, they are attacked by the Chinese government and pilloried in the Chinese social media for uh, references that seem somehow to support Taiwan or Hong Kong as defined by the party. A very harmless uh, things like posting Taiwan on the website in a way that somehow suggests that it is separate from China. Um, in most cases, those companies uh, uh, react, of course, uh, by apologizing uh, and issuing statements to the, to the Chinese government and the Chinese people, apologizing for this grievous mistake they've made. Uh, perhaps more seriously, we are seeing efforts by the government and the Chinese Communist Party to establish Communist Party cells in the China operations of some of our companies as well. Yeah. Um, at the same time, we see uh, multinationals uh, showing very little hesitation uh, about turning a blind eye to uh, things like human rights abuses. Uh, we've seen many examples of companies, including our own, that are 
uh, directly or indirectly doing business, for example, in Xinjiang, which as you just mentioned is the site of one of the worst human rights tragedies now unfolding in the world with the persecution of the ethnic uh, minority Muslim, mainly Uyghurs. Um, we've also seen a number of US companies that have helped support by uh, selling services and products, uh, help support the rise of the Chinese surveillance state. So my question for you is, what role do you think the government has in supporting our companies as they start to confront uh, some of these challenges or demands from the Chinese government that we may not think are uh, appropriate for them to, to, to bend to? And um, at the same time, what is the role of the government here in the US and also the people, uh, the uh, society as a whole in policing or trying to influence the behavior of those of our companies that are involved in business practices or in parts of China or in businesses in China that really run counter to the values that we hold here? Yeah, no, I, the, you know, this, um, <clears throat> Uh, Beijing, to, to all the examples you, you've just given, uh, or I, I think are emblematic of a, a very deliberate policy by Beijing now to force American businesses to choose. They can either uh, represent U.S. values and, and democratic norms, uh, uh, or they can do business in China and, and, and leave all of that behind. And, and when I say leave it behind, that doesn't just mean maintain your values when you're when you're home. It means that China increasingly does not want those companies uh, um, exemplifying those those values even in other parts of the world because again that paranoid mindset of the party, the, a communist party that that lives in a state of almost catastrophic anxiety that that everything could fly apart at any moment and that, that, that it could lose its grip on power because it knows that it doesn't have. Uh, fundamental legitimacy uh, uh, with its own people. Uh, it, increasingly, they're saying you have to choose. You either have to live by our rules and norms, which means shut your mouths about things like a genocide in Xinjiang or uh, the threat of war uh, uh, with Taiwan uh, or the undermining of, uh, of the rule of law and democracy in Hong Kong. You can either keep your mouths shut about that um, or, or you can forget about um, uh, having uh, any access to the Chinese market. And so at the same time that that's happening, with the Trump administration and now with, with uh, I think, a significant degree of continuity in the early policy declarations uh, of the Biden administration on China policy, what you're seeing is a hardening of, of, uh, of a consensus in Washington, bipartisan consensus, bicameral, it's, it's executive as well as, uh, um, as legislative, uh, you, you have this consensus that the US has to take uh, significant steps now to, to push back against China's um, uh, aggression and its attempts to uh, uh, you know, uh, interfere in our democracies. And so US business leaders increasingly look like sailors who are trying to straddle two boats. And, and uh, when you try to do that, there's a high probability that you're gonna get wet. And uh, so I think U US CEOs are uh, only beginning to wake up to the very different geostrategic realities uh, that have come to the fore over the last four years and which I think are gonna continue uh, with President Biden's uh, policy. I read his interim strategic guidance, uh, which, which uh, was fairly strong on and consistent, I think, uh, with that with that bipartisan uh, um, consensus that I'm describing, um, I, I think that these CEOs have, have, have not woken up to, to the fact that they're now standing in the middle of a landmine. And uh, in, in every direction, they're facing regulatory risk, they're facing um, uh, reputational risk related to uh, China's human rights violations, a fiduciary risk, given the fact that um, uh, the US government is trying to uh, rein in American investment that has been flowing passively into Chinese military-backed companies and also some of the worst human rights violating companies, companies that are complicit in the apartheid state that's being set up in, in, uh, in uh, Xinjiang. So uh, if I were a CEO, I'd be working very hard to try to educate myself on this new geostrategic reality and I'd be doing a lot more careful risk assessment 
for um, for all of those factors and also for the for their supply chains. Beijing's uh, stated grand strategy is to control supply chains for high tech globally. They want to be able to uh, exert that leverage, that economic leverage, to achieve political gains. Uh, so we're, we're living in uh, a, a different a different place from where we were several years ago, and I think that the American business community is only is is only vaguely <laughs> becoming aware uh, of the very different world that they're now operating in. Mm. Okay, I'd like to turn to uh, some of our um, audience questions, which are very good. Uh, first, uh, you mentioned in your Meet the Press interview uh, that the Chinese Communist Party did not turn to their CDC. Uh, Center for Disease Control to deal with this crisis, the pandemic. They turned to their military. Could you expand on what exactly you mean by that and how the Chinese military was involved? Yeah, so when um, the pandemic began, it began as an outbreak uh, in Wuhan sometime in the fall of 2019, um, uh, certainly uh, November uh, is, is when um, most epidemiologists believe that, that it uh, was certainly no later than November that this first began. The first um, confirmed cases were, uh, uh, for example, you know, December 1st, people who were, were turning up at hospitals and so forth. Um, the, the head of the Chinese CDC uh, who uh, is a, uh, a, a well-regarded, well-trained scientist who had, who had actually uh, spent years in the United States working at our CDC, had, had uh, a close working relationship with members of, of the U.S. CDC team in, in Atlanta and as well as at our embassy in Beijing. Um, he was not informed, um, according to uh, 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 a Wall Street Journal report that came out of the summer, he, he didn't know until the end of December. So, so at least, you know, uh, weeks after uh, this, this outbreak began, um, uh, authorities waited until then to actually inform him that it happened. And then it was another 19 or 20 days. It was uh, January 19th um, before he was even permitted to visit Wuhan. The head of the Chinese CDC was not permitted to visit Wuhan until the day before they shut down the city. And that was actually months into the outbreak. Um, what China did do was send the head of its biological warfare program uh, from the PLA to go take over that uh, laboratory and to help coordinate uh, the overall effort. So I've heard that there's been some speculation that, well, maybe it's just that only the local government knew and they didn't want the central government to know. Uh, we, we now know that that's false. We know the central government, uh, at, the, at the party at least, um, was uh, uh, aware and was active, actively involved in the effort to silence um, citizen journalists as well as doctors who first raised the alarm, including Dr. Li Wenliang, uh, who uh, raised the alarm, uh, was one of the earliest doctors to raise the alarm about this new strain of a dangerous uh, respiratory disease that was spreading. Uh, the central government propaganda apparatus uh, at the beginning of January, ran um, uh, national news broadcasts attacking Dr. Li Wenliang as a rumor monger and uh, making clear that people need to shut their mouths and that they're going to be prosecuted uh, by the Chinese Public Security Bureau if they uh, talk about things like a circulating uh, uh, virus. So um, you'll, you'll notice that in January, the State Department put out a fact sheet that also asserted that um, the Chinese military has been involved in uh, uh, animal uh, and, and, and other experimental research uh, on viruses at the um, Wuhan Institute of Virology going back uh, several years. That's a fact that has not been um, con uh, ever, ever confirmed or, or acknowledged by the Chinese government. Uh, we know it's true. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, the Washington Post yesterday reported that the Biden administration has has asserted the facts that were laid out in that fact sheet as being accurate. In other words, um, that was a very carefully crafted uh, uh, fact sheet. The Biden administration asserts as well that that, that those are the facts in that sheet are uh, are true. Um, but I also want to caution that that doesn't mean that this necessarily came out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It is possible that this was a natural, um, uh, uh, naturally occurring virus that jumped 
from animals uh, to human beings, um, we don't know for sure. We probably won't know because the Chinese Communist Party has made it very, very hard uh, for us to gather any of the information that would allow us to eliminate either possibility. So I, I, I'm in the camp uh, along with a growing number of scientists, including uh, a number of scientists who, who uh, wrote a recent um, uh, open letter to the World Health Organization. I, I'm of the view that, uh, that uh, it, it is uh, very much possible that this did emerge from the laboratory and that the effort undertaken by Beijing and by the WHO is wholly insufficient, completely insufficient uh, uh, as far as a credible uh, investigation would go that would be able to prove one way or the other uh, where this thing actually originated. That was, I, I think, another uh, uh, part of the Face the Nation interview that certainly got a lot of attention. And that was you saying that uh, that you did, I don't want to uh, misphrase or misquote you, but saying that you, the preponderance of evidence suggested to you that it, that it was uh, the source of, of, of the pandemic was a lab leak. Um, go ahead. Yeah, well, sir, sir, yeah, it, the, the evidence is circumstantial. Um, I, it, it, there, there's a, um, a, a advisor to the WHO uh, who it was a Clinton administration National Security Council official named Jamie Metzel, who keeps a, um, uh, a, uh, a, a running tally <laughs> uh, on his uh, blog, his web blog, of all of the circumstantial evidence uh, in support of the possibility that this emerged from a laboratory. It's an extremely compelling, lengthy list of, of, of bullet points. The bullet points on the other side of the ledger that this came naturally is actually quite short. There, the, in fact, some of the early leads that, uh, that led to speculation that this occurred naturally have since been uh, ruled out. For example, the Huanan seafood market across the street from the Wuhan, one of the Wuhan labs, uh, the Wuhan C uh, CDC lab, and, and just a couple kilometer kilometers from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, even the Chinese CDC has ruled out that that was the source of this, uh, uh, the source of this virus. So, so in some ways, there's a shrinking list of, of circumstantial evidence for the natural uh, um, uh, emergence hypothesis and a growing number of bullet points, circumstantial in support of a, uh, an, a lab accident as being the source of this pandemic. Okay. By the way, there were, there were numerous laboratory accidents in some of China's most prestigious laboratories that led to death uh, in, uh, uh, from other viruses, including the, the, uh, the SARS virus from 2003. The, the Beijing Center for Disease Control uh, accidentally leaked that virus. It led to multiple infections and, and a fatality. Uh, there were three other uh, leaks uh, of that virus from, from that and other Chinese uh, laboratories that uh, uh, claimed to have very good safety practices in place. And by the way, these kinds of outbreaks have occurred in the, in the United States as well uh, throughout our history. Uh, the the New, New York Magazine a few months ago wrote a lengthy piece in their intelligence uh, section that goes through the history of, uh, of, of laboratory accidents and, and makes its own circumstantial case for this probably uh, having been a, uh, a, a accidental lab, lab leak. I, I, I refer you to that article. I thought they did a good job of, of sort of exploring that history. Uh, these labs are not infallible. <laughs> Human beings are not infallible. The kind of research that they were doing is cutting edge. It, it is, uh, is gain-of-function research where you uh, genetically alter mice so that they uh, have human lungs, humanized lungs, not natural mice lungs, but lungs that can contain the same receptors that human lungs have. And then they drive uh, wild caught and, and also laboratory uh, uh, experimental viruses through those models to try to understand how those viruses and the components of those viruses might react in human lungs. The purpose of this, of course, is to try to understand how to defend against uh, a, 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 a future pandemic, but it's possible that in doing that research, uh, scientists could ac accidentally actually seed the kind of pandemic that their research was designed to avoid in the first place. And as you say, the Chinese system, as, as we know it today, is built on uh, shielding that kind of information from, from the rest of the world. Um, uh, so who knows when we might ever know. Um, 
Thank you, Matt, for all your uh, extremely interesting thoughts and insights tonight. Um, uh, on behalf of myself and also the Mansfield Center, I wanna really thank you for taking this time to talk to all of us tonight. Um, I'm gonna hand it now back to our director, Dina Mansoor. Thank you again, Matt. Thanks, Tim. It's great to be with you. Great, well, I wanna add my thanks, Matt. That was really um, a spectacular insight into what you've been working on during the last four years um, in the Trump administration. I wanna thank our audience for joining us tonight, uh, to Tiff for doing such a wonderful job moderating, and a reminder that we do have two dialogues remaining in the civil society um, uh, dialogues in March. Join us on March 24th. Our next one uh, will host two campaign managers, one is Missoula's own uh, Shelby Dantic, uh, who will talk about how she flipped the only seat in the country that went from uh, Republican to Democrat. And we'll have Amanda Stevens, who will talk about how her candidate aligned with the Trump um, uh, ideology and was able to flip a seat in New York from Democrat to Republican. Um, and then our final one will be with U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, Dan Crittenbrink, who will talk about the importance of trust as a basis for reconciliation. So thanks again to Matt, to Tiff, to all of you. Good night. Thanks, Tina. Thanks.